Okay, so first off, what we're gonna look at here is the main branches of the celiac artery. We can see all three of them demonstrated pretty well just in this view. The first of them being this large artery right here, and that's gonna be the splenic artery. The splenic artery, again, is a main or major branch from our celiac artery. The splenic artery comes down and along its way, as it travels along the greater curvature of the stomach, it's going to be giving off short little arteries over here to the greater curvature of the stomach, those being the short gastric arteries. The most distal of these is going to continue along the greater curvature of the stomach. So the termination of the splenic along the greater curvature of the stomach is going to be the left gastroepiploic artery. The next branch of the celiac that we're going to see is this large branch right here, and that's going to be the left gastric artery. The left gastric artery in the equine comes to the lesser curvature of the stomach, right along the left side of the saccus cecus, AKA the fundus of the equine stomach. Here we can see that that left gastric splits into two different branches. This branch that's going on the side of the stomach that's closer to the viscera within the animal is gonna be the visceral branch. And this branch here that's going down towards the liver is going to be the parietal branch. The third and final branch of the celiac artery is the hepatic artery. We can see the hepatic artery here and here's a nice example of a pancreatic branch of the hepatic artery coming right over here to our pancreas. Here we also see some pancreatic branches that are likely coming from the splenic artery here. Okay, Any short little branch that's going into the pancreas is just a pancreatic branch. As we continue down or distally from the hepatic, we see an artery right here coming off, going to the lesser curvature of the stomach on the right side. That's going to be the right gastric artery. After the right gastric artery comes off, the hepatic will kind of terminate as our gastroduodenal artery. The only other things to look at here would be any larger branches that are actually going down into the liver itself, like that would be a hepatic branch of the hepatic artery. Going back to this branch, which is the gastroduodenal artery, the gastroduodenal artery will then terminate into two separate arteries. This artery that we see right here traveling along the greater curvature of the stomach on the right side is gonna be your right gastroepiploic artery. And finally, we see this artery here that's traveling down in between the right lobe of the pancreas and the duodenum. That would be our cranial pancreatico duodenal artery. So before we move on to some of the other arteries, let's look at some of the viscera here. We can see our spleen is lying right here. This is gonna be kind of the medial aspect of the spleen, and this is gonna be the lateral aspect of the spleen. As we continue, we'll flip over here and look at the liver. If we look at the liver of equine, we see that it's kind of pushed from the left side over towards the right side of the body. So if we look up under here, we can see the left lobe of the liver with the left lateral and left medial lobes. Next, we will come to this lobe, which is going to be the quadrate, or I'm sorry, yes, the quadrate lobe, okay? The quadrate lobe is always right next to the right lobe of the liver. Now, in our large animal species, the right lobe is not subdivided into medial and lateral. It's just the right lobe. If we flip this liver over and look on the deep aspect, we will see this little projection right here. And that's going to be the caudate process of the caudate lobe. We can see the duodenum right here. Very good view of the cranial duodenal flexure moving into the descending duodenum, and then we have the caudal duodenal flexure moving into the ascending duodenum. 
Okay, so we're picking up where we left off. We are again at our descending duodenum right here. Our de descending duodenum moves into the caudal duodenal flexure and moves into our ascending duodenum. Along the ascending duodenum is where you should usually find an artery traveling right along it called the caudal pancreaticoduodenal artery. And again, it's going to be supplying some of the pancreas we can see right here, as well as the ascending duodenum. The ascending duodenum then makes this quick flexure right here. This is the duodeno-jejunal flexure, after which we move into the jejunum. Within the jejunum, we will see, or within the mesojejunum, that's where we will find our jejunal arteries. So within all of this mesentery here, we have those very long jejunal arteries, or the jejunal arcades, supplying blood to the jejunum itself. Now as we continue distally, the next organ we will get to is going to be the ilium. The ilium is going to be supplied by a branch that's from kind of the distal most jejunal artery, which we see running right through here, and terminating as the ileal artery. The ileal artery will then anastomose with an artery inside the mesoilium that's going to be originating from the iliocolic or I'm, yes, iliocolic artery, and that's going to be the mesenteric br ileal branch of the iliocolic artery, traveling along this mesenteric aspect of the ilium. We see this structure right here in between the ilium and the cecum. That's going to be the ileocecal fold that's going to be attaching to the dorsal band of the cecum. So the ilium moves into the cecum and dumps into the cecum. So now this structure that we see right here is the cecum with the base, body, and apex. Okay, so again we see this ileocecal fold attaching onto the dorsal band of the cecum. The next we come to, there's going to be an artery, and this artery is the medial cecal artery. The medial cecal artery, again, originates from the iliocolic artery and is traveling along the medial band of the cecum. When it comes to the cecum, there are four distinct bands, or tinea cecae. We've already seen the dorsal band that has the iliocecal fold attaching to it. We see the medial band has this medial cecal artery and usually a bunch of fat covering it. We can also see this line of cecal lymph nodes. The third band is going to be this ventral band, which actually has nothing attaching or lying on top of it. And finally, if we flip this over, now we see an area that we have both a fold as well as an artery. So this is going to be the lateral cecal band with the cecocolic fold and the lateral cecal artery. So each one of these bands has something unique. The lateral band has a fold and an artery, the cecocolic fold and the lateral cecal artery. The ventral has nothing lying or attaching to it. The medial has an artery within it, the medial cecal artery. And finally, the dorsal band has this iliocecal fold attaching to it. So those are a couple different ways that you can determine which artery is which and which direction is which when trying to orient with this cecum. Now, as for the movement of ingesta, Ingesta will then, let's reorient this thing, kind of how it would be in the body. Ingesta will then move from the cecum into the ascending colon. And the first part of the ascending colon, or the most proximal portion of the ascending colon, is going to be the right ventral colon that has four bands, or tinea coli. Let's pause it. 
as we move from the right ventral colon into the left ventral colon, we see that there would normally be a flexure right here that would be up against the sternum. That is the sternal flexure. So it moves from the right ventral colon through the sternal flexure to the left ventral colon. Then we get this very sharp turn from the left ventral colon into the left dorsal colon. That very sharp turn or flexure is the pelvic flexure. So it's at the pelvic flexure that we move from the ventral to the dorsal colon, which means we're now at the most distal portion of the colon or of the ascending colon. So the left dorsal colon has this next flexure right here that's usually just dorsal to the sternal flexure and that's going to be the diaphragmatic flexure. It's at this point that we transition into the right dorsal colon. After that, we move from the right dorsal colon into a very short transverse colon. And from the transverse colon, we move into the descending colon. Now each one of these parts and pieces has a different type of arterial supply and they look a little bit different. So whenever we're looking to try and distinguish which is which, we have to look at these bands or these tinea coli. There are four bands on the right, four bands on the left ventral colons, one band on the left dorsal colon, three bands on the right dorsal colon, usually two on the transverse, and then two on the descending. So if you kind of think of it as a phone number and start the cecum, it goes four, 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 one, three, two, two. Kind of help, help you remember the uh, number of bands on each one of these. So let's talk a little bit about the arterial supply. And what we're gonna see here, we see this very large artery. Right here, that's coming along, and it's actually traveling along the ventral colon. So, if we see an artery that's traveling along the ventral colon, that means we're going to be looking at the colic branch of the iliocolic artery. So, here we actually see the iliocolic artery. Next, if we see a large artery that's going to be traveling along, it hasn't been opened up quite yet here, but if we open up right along this left dorsal colon, we'll see another large artery. So any artery that's supplying the left and right dorsal colons is going to be the right colic artery. The right colic artery and the colic branch of the iliocolic will anastomose at the area of the pelvic flexure. Next, we see an artery coming right over here towards our transverse colon. That's gonna be the middle colic artery that's supplying our transverse colon. And then if we look within this mesocolon right here, that's where we should find our caudal mesenteric artery coming down to supply our left colic artery to supply our descending colon. So just to remind you, our iliocolic artery gives off the branches, the colic branch of the iliocolic artery. It gives off the lateral and medial cecal arteries, and finally, the mesenteric ileal branch of the iliocolic artery. Finally, we're gonna look at a couple veins right here. We see this very large vein that's going through the pancreas. That's going to be the portal vein. The portal vein is going through this hole or this opening within the pancreas known as the annulus pancreatus. 
Here is a very nice demonstration of the different lobes of the pancreas. We see this lobe right here that's going to be associated with the descending duodenum. That's the right lobe of the pancreas. And then we see the body and finally the left lobe of the pancreas. Again, that annulus pancreatus is just a hole that's made within the pancreas to allow that portal vein to move through it. Here we're looking at a plastinated equine stomach with the esophagus coming into the cardiac region or the cardia. In equine, the esophagus empties into the non-glandular region of the stomach. This delineation or boundary you see right here is the margo placatus, which is the boundary or limitation between the non-glandular and glandular parts of the stomach. As we move through the pyloric region and through the pylorus of the equine stomach, it's within this region here, around the cranial duodenal flexure, that we will find the major duodenal papilla in the equine and a unique structure just inside of it, which is the hepatopancreatic ampulla. This is where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct will empty in an equine. And if we look just ventral to that, we will see the minor duodenal papilla where the accessory pancreatic duct will empty in an equine.